fact that occult circles even exist till this day should alarm you. Those same people who are practicing this occult magic within society to rule the world, to literally rule the world, are reading these same texts that I'm about to talk to you about. We're going to be focusing on a peculiar form of creation today. That's the homunculus. And the homunculus comes from a Latin miniature human. This is an Aristotelian thought. And this is what inspired all these alchemists. I want to brace the listeners for a lot of the things I'm about to, to say because it does get really weird. Yo, what up? It's Donut, and we got a special guest. We got the One on One podcast. What's up, dude? Thank you for having me, man. We recently just met each other on My Family Thinks I'm Crazy. Illuminati confirmed, but that was your podcast, right? It's all three of ours podcasts. So it's it's every it's a project we all do together. It's fun. It's fantastic. Your guys' show is amazing. Mystic Mark is amazing. My family thinks I'm crazy. So homunculus, this is something we're going to talk about. I have the history from the very first mention of the homunculus until the 16th century, which what you pulled up there was the Paracelsian version, the father of toxicology. And he, the dose makes the poison. And he was a weird guy. Back then, you got to understand science was still new. They were learning about everything, about nature, about the fabric of reality, about everything. And religion ruled a majority of history. It was all superstition and, and religion was at the core at, of, at, at all these things. So it's, you know, God creates life. Nobody else can do that. Well, you have alchemy, which is the sacred chemistry. The homunculus right. is a byproduct of alchemy. So I want to start off with this quote by Stephen Hawking. I think computer viruses should count as life. I think it says something about human nature that the only form of life we created so far is purely destructive. We've created life in our own image. All throughout these stories of creation, you have the creation of man through a magical process, either involving dust or clay. And the story of the Anunnaki, what is man? A genetically born being that they use one of the Anunnaki wombs in order to create this slave, right? The slave that was supposed to help mine for gold. In the story of Genesis, the Lord God formed the man from dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In Greek cosmology, Prometheus, right, shaped man out of mud and Athena breathed life into the into his clay figure. So throughout all of history we have, and Prometheus is the one that gave God man fire and he was outcasted by the titans and he it was seems like the illuminati love prometheus or at least the story of it well he's the light bringer he's he's lucifer he's the illuminator he's the one that gives the forbidden knowledge the forbidden fruit to man that they weren't supposed to have since the very beginning and he is forever tormented for eternity where he is to be chained up and in I think it's a vulture and eagles to eat his liver every single day. It regenerates every single day. Wait. With all this said, right, the ultimate power that God has is the ability to create life from nothing. That's, you know, what God giveth, God taketh. And man has always tried, but he always falls short. Something, Something's always not right. And I've talked about this with the uncanny valley with AI and robotics and all these things that sprout from that. Okay, okay, I see that. Yeah, there you go. They formed it out of clay and then Athena... She breathed life into it. And you see that in the Genesis story with Adam in the Talmud. Adam was a golem. And we'll get into that. Nowadays, we have what's called CRISPR technology where you're able to quote unquote edit or even clone DNA. And I didn't know that the first human clone was created in November of 1998. But after 12 days, they quote unquote destroyed the embryo. So they claim. Right. And it was half man, half cow. And keep the cow in mind, because this subject, I think we're going to piss off two crowds of people. We're going to piss off today. Well, three. We're going to Chris. We're going to piss off women because these guys back then were misogynists. And, and some of the aspects you're going to see is like, wait, what? That's kind of that's that's kind of seeing women in a bad light. But back then, again, the, these guys were products of their time. 
We have to understand that. I am simply a researcher bringing this information to light. I don't think so. anybody's going to be upset. Like we're <laughs> we're searching truth. We learn in knowledge. We're uncovering the occult. Yeah, no, I, I don't think anybody will be upset at all. It's going to get weird today, bro. I just want to brace you for that. It's bro, gonna I'm, get... I'm so excited, dude. I got no sleep. <laughs> I'm, I've been up, bro. I've been up since 10 p.m. My time. Jeez, dude. And I've just been like, homunculus, homunculus. The I can't homunculus wait. Homunculus is it's in your dream. So th these people in 98, they created a half man, half cow embryo. And they supposedly killed it after 12 days. And they... I also want to note that cloning is illegal in a lot of countries. It's right. actually an illegal practice, not because it can't be done, but because it can be done in the Bible. God would forbid man uh, from mixing certain mixtures, right? You couldn't mix certain herbs and certain things within the Bible. So that was prohibited. So that relates to necromancy and all these other, there you go by advanced cell technology. I did not, not know this, bro. Dude, I didn't know this either. And I made a clone documentary and I couldn't, I didn't even <laughs> uncover this. I went into Dolly the sheep and how cloning is legal here. FDA approved. We're allowed to eat cloned meat. They don't have to tell us that we're eating cloned meat. FDA. George Bush came out, said he was going to end the cloning program after Bill Clinton told uh, the world that they're moving it to the private sector. But the government won't do it, but the private sector would. I want to make it clear that the things that we're going to be talking about today, because you talk a lot about the Illuminati and the elites and the people who they practice the occult. The United States was founded on occult roots. The, the people that were involved in the creation, this homunculus of a country were part of secret societies. You could say they were Rosicrucians. You could say they were Freemasons. They were part of occult circles. And the fact that occult circles even exist till this day should alarm you. Those same people who are practicing this occult magic within society to rule the world, to literally rule the world, were, are reading these same texts that I'm about to talk to you about and that I'm about to present to you. Bro, they are dude. using this same magic in order to, like I said, there are various things that I found very interesting. There's how to make armies and how to project giants in the sky today, bro. There's going to be well, a lot of stuff we're going to be getting into. So, well, like <laughs> just to add on top of what you're saying, when we were going through the slides of Paracelsus, this statue of him is in Bavaria, where the Illuminati was founded. The whole story of Frankenstein, too, started in where the Illuminati was founded. And it is about making it's alive it's about what we're talking about it's an artificial man it's it's i believe it's part of the transhumanistic uh, agenda where uh frankenstein is a little bit different than a homunculus and we can get into that dude and we're gonna get into some heretic like i said heretical ideas so don't shoot the messenger this is only information that i am relaying so the <laughs> ultimate taboo of man is to usurp god to take god's position and this can be traced back to the story of creation when eve goes against god's command and i'm, and I'm coming from a christian standpoint i was born and raised pentecostal christian i don't i don't i no longer practice christianity but i do believe that there is a god i do believe that there is a source uh, so I just want to make that clear. So I'm coming at this when I when I make certain references, I'm coming at from a Christian point of view. So I'm talking about the yeah. story of creation, the book of Genesis, where Eve eats the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she goes against the word of God and chooses to disobey it. And the rest is history. They are aborted from the Garden of Eden and man is man and woman is forever cursed after that. We're going to be focusing on a peculiar form of creation today or abomination depending on who you ask because back then these guys were very proud about these creations and that's the homunculus and the homunculus comes from a latin term that means a little man or a miniature human and it is a representation of a small human being originally depicted as a small statue made of clay and what you've pulled up there you see that that picture with the man with the big hands and the big mouth that's called the cortical homunculus and it is a distorted representation of the human body based on the neurological map uh, of the areas and proportions of the human brain dedicated to processing motor functions so it shows you by size how much the body uses certain things in the brain 
And it looks like it's down to a science, bro. That kind of scares me that what this is real because they got it down. So this is a scientific interpretation of a homunculus. And th th they call that the cortex man. And it illustrates the concept of representation, the body lying within the brain. So what the brain controls and how much of it it controls is the size of its appendages. Wow. And that's what you're seeing there. And in psychology, this is really interesting because we start to see, I'm going to paint a picture for everybody of how these ideas evolve throughout time. In psychology, we have something known as the homunculus argument. And this argument comes from a theory dubbed the Cartesian theater. And people know Rene Descartes, but it has nothing to do with Rene Descartes and Cartesian philosophy. And what essentially it states is, what are we seeing? What is interpreting what we're seeing? So back then they thought that it was a little homunculus inside of our brain watching a screen of everything that we're seeing <laughs> just like in men in black <laughs> yeah exactly just like in men in black so it's called the homunculus argument but it is a phenomenon that cancels itself out because then it'd be homunculus you've, you've heard turtles all the way down right well it's homunculus <laughs> all the way down because there's a homunculus inside the homunculus's brain that's watching you right so there's a homunculus in your brain and there's a homunculus in that homunculus's brain and so on and so oh, forth. I, like a Russian doll. Exact ad infinitum. So it keeps going for forever. Gotta so, show that MIB. <laughs> yeah, there you go. In neuroanatomy, we already talked about the cortical homunculus, which is the one that you pulled up with the unproportionate sizes of the body. And it represents, it's a neurological map of the areas of the human brain and the body. And the one that we're going to be talking about today, it was popularized in the 16th century. And it's the alchemical homunculus, homunculi for plural. And this revolves around alchemy and the philosophical art of it. Alchemy, for those that don't know, is a, it's a magical process of transformation, creation, and combination. In alchemy, it is an artificial human created by magic. A homunculus does the bidding of its creator. But before we get into that, I want to give a background of where these ideas came from how these ideas were implemented in people's minds because it came from somewhere and that's the picture that i want to paint today the concept comes from a formally adopted biological science that's preformationism, and it states that everything in nature comes from a smaller version of itself so essentially what i was talking about the homunculus argument where it's a little man within your brain that's watching you and then ad infinitum well a little right. person turns into a grown person. That's what they believed back then. Like if you go back and study like the origins of sex and why most people like watching gangbang porn, I know it sounds kind of like out there that all the tribes, they didn't understand that there was one sperm. So the entire tribe would have sex Whoa. with so all the that made sense because then everyone would be the child's father and it was good for the community. That's why it's the number one searched. It taps into our ancestral roots is what you're trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I know that's weird. I know that's weird, but I wanted to get weird with this podcast. We're, we're, trust me, we're going to get weird, bro. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> so the, you have this idea of preformationism, where every little grown thing comes from a little version of itself. And Daddy Pythagoras, right, mm. Daddy, because it all goes back Daddy to Pythagoras, Pythagoras. Yeah. is credited with originating the term spermism and he is also i don't know if you knew because i learned this recently he's the father of eugenics right so that's no why way. that's yeah that's what i said and that's why plato talks about eugenics in his work the republic because wow. he's, pythagoras paved the way for all these great minds spermism is the idea that the father contributes essential characteristics of their offspring well, again this is going to get controversial while the mother only contributes a material substrate okay we're going to go there and i know that sounds really bad but this is history these men were products of their time so don't crucify me and aristotle agreed with pythagoras and elaborated on the concept that which lasted until the 17th century. So you have these guys in the years 400, 500, 600, 700, and their ideas lasted until the 17th century through, look at that, through the end of the 18th century. That's and that wasn't that long ago. That's mm -hmm. when the, like America was founded, these occultists. 
<laughs> That's what, dude. If you think about it, racism ended what 50, 60 years ago? It's not that long ago that people, and there's still racist people even today. There's so many racist people. What's wrong with people? You know what I mean? I, We're all I, human. I know what it is, bro. It's just that people are scared of what they don't know. And it's sure. also victimhood. This is where I think it's at is that people need someone. Hey, look, you need to point your finger at me and say I'm the bad guy. <laughs> they want to point a finger. This person is oppressing us. This is it. This, you know. And I think mm -hmm. that's also where it is the fear. It's all fear. And it, I, I, I'm, I hate it. I don't like it. Yeah, neither do I. I think we're we're all homunculus at the end of the day, and we all bleed the same. So let's all treat each other with some respect. So we have the idea of Aristotelian biology, and this was the ideas of Aristotle, and in his works of biology that that Aristotle influenced pre-modern natural scientists of the time. And during Aristotle's time, they viewed reproduction from two different angles that of spontaneous generation and sexual generation. Spontaneous generation was prevalent in Greek mythology, which influenced Aristotle. Therefore, he influenced the rest of those people. During his time, it was pretty much fact. It was accepted as true. Nobody was questioning the narrative. And they believed that spontaneous generation could be triggered at will by mixing the correct natural ingredients and allowing them to putrefy. Putrefaction is going to be playing a big role in today's lecture or presentation. I don't know what you want to call this. For example, they believe that uh, a little baby chick would, the reason that a baby chick would come to being and, and, and become alive was because the gelatinous phlegm inside of the egg would putrefy and that would birth the chick. That's, this is what these people were thinking, which they aren't essentially wrong. They, you, you, you can start seeing where they, where they kind of were stumbling, but you got to remember they were trying to figure out religion, sciences, everything all at once. So it was a lot of information that they were processing and they were doing pretty good for, again, if this lasted to the 17th, 18th century, they were doing pretty damn well of coming up with ideas. How do they build the pyramids? This is something that's a whole nother episode, a whole nother episode of these ideas that have been implemented in our Rothschild and Rockefeller education systems that really right. blur the lines between ancient civilizations and all that and, stuff. So. And the Rockefeller Center got the Prometheus statue right in the front of Rockefeller Plaza. No, he's Lucifer. So, I mean, they 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 worship the serpent, they, the the knowledge bringer. That's the whole thing in the Garden of Eden. It was Sophia, right, from the Gnostic cosmology that was telling Eve to eat from the tree so they would learn that they were in a false matrix. Again, back to this homunculus idea of Yao de Boath and his cronies where man has always been a homunculus in the figurative sense and a literal sense, if you want to believe the stories of creation. This goes back to mythology. With Mythology is the, is the psychology of humanity, if you really want to think about it that way. I've heard Daddy Manly P. Hall talk about it like that. Daddy Manny P. Hall. Manly Penis Hall, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very manly P. Yeah. So in Metamorphosis, Ovid says that bees come from rotting cattle, wafts come from horses, scorpions from crab shells, snakes from decomposing spinal cords, and perhaps mice from slime. And varying subjects that are put through different putre levels of putrefaction make different things. And this is, this is going to play a role. This is an Aristotelian thought. And this is what inspired all these alchemists of their time. Putrefaction. Yeah. So when things rot. The fifth stage of death. The fifth. Well, see, I didn't even know that. The fifth stage of death. So this is after everything has already left the body. And this is how you get people who are bloated and stuff like that. They, they're putrefying. They are decaying. They're yeah. rotting, essentially. So they believe that this created new life. Reminds and me of the mummies. Well, I think I have a different take on the movies. I think that they were preserving the body so they could come back to it at mm, a certain time. Certain. Right. So that, right. that's what I think mummies are. But people were eating mummies. There, There is medicinal cannibalism, which we could do a whole episode on that, where people back then they were eating corpses because they thought it was good for them and it helped them it, with digestion and all these things. So people were eating mummy dust as well. And wow. there was at a time where graves were being robbed so much that they had to put a stop to it. Uh, medicinal cannibalism. Look into it, bro. It's messed wow. up. Wow. 
That's wild. In wow. Etym- <laughs> in etymologies the seventh century bishop isidore of seville claimed honeybees were generated out of rotten cattle bumblebees from horses drones from mules so it got more specific as time went on right so they're taking these ideas and transforming them as time went on and virgil the poet virgil from dante's inferno he took this a step further in his work georgics And Virgil wrote about how to replenish a beehive with artificial bees through the use of begonia. Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit weird. And we're going to we're going to crank it up to 10 after this, because begonia was a ritual based on the belief that bees were spontaneously regenerated from a cow's carcass. Now, the way that this was done, and I don't condone animal violence But you got to understand that if these people back then, if they did this to an animal, imagine what they wouldn't do to a human. This is the beating of a cow as to not break its skin until it's dead and it's pretty much pulp. And when you would let this sit, the bees would eventually generate from the rotting corpse of this cow that you just beat to a pulp. Very dark. So you're supposed to take this cow and just beat the living crap out of it until it until it liquefies itself inside. Then you spray a little bit of a spray a little bit of thyme and cinnamon and all this stuff and from that there comes bees. <laughs> These are again the scholars claim that the ritual had more of a poetic merit to it. It was genius. It was, it was not an actual. <laughs> the bees are dying. We need to smush some cows. <laughs> you need to kill a cow. Exactly. So, but this is just the way that people viewed how things came to be. And again, they are products of their time. And All I right. want to read a little bit. A narrow site restricted for its use. And this is from Virgil, the ritual of Begonia. A narrow site restricted for its use is chosen first. They wall it in, impose a narrow arching roof, insert four windows, sloping toward the winds for feeble light. They find a two-year calf with sprouting horns, whose nostrils and whose breathing mouth they stop, so they kill it. Enclose, despite his struggles, beat and pulverize the carcass while they leave the skin intact. I want to talk about how there is a symbolic representation to things and a literal comprehension to things. Maybe these guys are writing with green language. But it's very specific to use this violence and this gruesomeness when writing about a secret message. We know cryptography. We know all these things. And back then, magicians and all these different people, they wanted to hide the fact that they were doing magic. I know that, but I'm just reading it from the literal point of view. And later we can get into the symbolism behind it. They pulverize it in the carcass while they leave the skin intact. Here, his flanks, all this is done. When west wind ruffles oceans, waves, and springs. So you see this poetic language of like, is this really a ritual? Or are they trying to hide something? And before meadows bloom bloom in bright new colors, before the chattering swallows, hangs her nest in rafted barns. Meanwhile, within the corpse, the fluids heat, the soft bones tepify, and creatures fashioned wonderfully appear. These are the bees. First void of limbs, but soon a weir with wings. They swarm. After all this is done and everything is rotting, here come the bees. Aristotle, he also had an explanation for lice and it, what they called itch mites. And this was purely, a lot of these things were purely based on observation. You got to remember that back then they didn't have morticians or people who do autopsies. That was forbidden. That was a forbidden art. You'd be ruled a necromancer if you were to dig up a body and try to examine it or vivisect it or, or dissect it or do whatever it was that you were trying to do with it. So and that's what Da Vinci did a lot. Do you know about that? Yes. And that's, that's where all these ideas of Frankenstein come from because it was a forbidden art. It was necromancy. That's what they were accused of doing because there were some people who were using these bodies for other extracurricular activities, if you know what I mean. You know, th- th- yeah. there's always that aspect of it. And Aristotle's theory of lice that they were produced out of the flesh. Right. So he would see these what he called eruptus forms that would come. So like pus and just pimples. And he would see the lice come out of that. So he said, oh, well, the body's producing these lice because there's a lot of humidity within the body. Mind you, this is what these guys were thinking back then. Aristotle's theory of sexual generation 
was that every material substance must contain matter and form. And these two forms, a sperm, which is the almost pure form, and menstrual blood, which is the almost pure matter. Now, the sperm acts as a form to the matter supplied by the menstrual blood in order to produce a living being. What essentially what, <laughs> what Aristotle believed was that at intercourse, there was a battle going on between the sperm and the menstrual blood. There was a war going on. And depending on who won was the, depending on what would be born, either a male or a female. So if the menstrual blood won, a female would be born and vice versa. If the sperm won, then a male would be born. So we have this early idea of biology, of reproduction being talked about by Aristotle. And this is what shaped up into the 18th century, bro, these ideas and other great minds, right, that would take ideas and change them. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. So if the male semen gains the mastery, it brings the material over itself. But if it gets mastered, it changes over either into its opposite or else into extinction. And the and this is kind of, again, uh, uh, misogynist, but the opposite of the male is the female, which is female in the virtue of its inability to affect concoction and of the coldness of its blood like nourishment. And that's the generation of animals. So again, again, there's essentially a battle going on between the sperm and the menstrual blood. Aristotle was a product of his time. Women were seen as inferior to men. Aristotle, like I said, accounted the gender differences because he believed that males were hotter than females. And yeah, because that, of that goes into like uh, the, have you ever seen the, you, you watch the office mm -hmm. when Dwight was trying to have a child with Angela, he said, you got to have a male. All you got to do is put the temperature at like 60 degrees or something. So I bet you that's where it comes from. Well, did you know Michael Scott was actually a magician of antiquity? Dude, I just <laughs> learned that. That's wild. Yeah. Because of their greater heat males, male embryos arrive at a greater degree of perfection than females do. And these are Aristotle's words. Aristotle states females are weaker and colder in their nature. And we should look upon the female state as being as it were a deformity because of the absence of the sexual appendage, right? The penis. This further proved that women lack perfection. And these oh, are the words this. of Aristotle. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> oh, it gets this. much worse than this. <laughs> it gets way worse than this. Uh, during, the, during the time, women were essentially viewed as contributing, contributing only secondarily, secondarily in generation. So they were pretty much incubators at the time. And Giles of Rome compares the sperm to a carpenter and the menstrual blood to wood. So man was the epicenter of everything. Man was the most powerful. Sperm was the most powerful, you know, was the nectar of the gods. And women were only there to just hold the seed until it was born. And that's the idea that they had back then. Aristotle didn't quite believe that human beings couldn't be born without both parents, but his followers after the fact, they didn't discriminate against these heretical ideas of coming up and making a man outside the matrix. That is a woman. This is his fault because sperm was given supernatural abilities and, and uh, it had pretty much like supernatural powers. It could cause giants and all these other different monstrosities, which Paracelsus talks about where your ill spent seed would go into the ground or something and it would create a monster. So, us as kids, bro, we probably made a few homunculus and monsters with that sock that we had in high school. Oh, I always exist. think about that, dude. I always <laughs> think about like, yo, it's going somewhere. Like if it's a condom wrapper or if whatever it is, where, where is it going? What kind of what's developing? Like well, something's got to be being created with your DNA. With, with the hot sauce that was putting hot sauce in his condoms, allegedly to kill <laughs> off the sperm. Is that Yeah, I heard that. I heard about that. Yeah, it makes, it makes you think, right? So the oh, idea because it makes it hot. Well, no, because it well, it's killing the sperm, so they can't use it for anything else. But probably it makes it hot. Who, I mean, I don't know. These trying again, to make these, some homunculuses. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so this would trigger the idea that what would happen? So after Aristotle, what would happen if we inserted this nectar of the gods, this sperm, this supernatural thing, into something other than a woman's womb and right. In comes the alchemical homunculus, which will be the center of our talk from here on out. And I want to again, I want to I want to brace the listeners 
for a lot of the things I'm about to, to say because it does get really weird at some points and I do bring up some heretical ideas, but again, I'm just a researcher. <laughs> Don't crucify me. Bro, this is like my favorite podcast ever. <laughs> so there you go. They thought that inside the sperm was another little man just like driving like Galactica, just fighting its way in towards the the, the egg of the woman. That's it what makes people sense. Think. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you, sense. you think of it. So the first mention of a homunculus is traced back to this enigmatic alchemist named Zosimos of Panopolis. Or Zosimos of Alchemista is what they call them. He was a great he was Greco Egyptian. Uh, he was a Gnostic mystic. And he lived towards the end of the 3rd and beginning of the 4th century AD. He wrote a series of books, uh, the oldest known literature on alchemy that, that we know of, uh, was written by this guy, Zosimos. Although Zosimos' homunculus is not like our traditional alchemical version, Carl Jung, he perceived the first concept of homunculus in Zosimos' writing called On Virtue. He describes a dream that he had. And this is quote, this is from a translation. And as he was saying these things and I was pressing him to talk, his eyes became like blood and he vomited forth his flesh. And I saw him change into a mutilated homunculus, but in the text it says anthroparian, biting himself and wounding himself with his own teeth. Seized with fear, I thought, it is not thus that the composition of water is produced. And I was convinced that I had understood well. Mind you, this is all green language. These guys were alchemists. They were trained in the art of cryptography and speaking in symbols. Why? Because they would be killed otherwise if they were to come out and say, hey, we're mixing these abominations together. These two things, I'm mixing the sperm of a bird and, and a man to create a winged man. You would be killed for that. That was witchcraft. That was necromancy. That was whatever it was. Carl Jung being a fan of alchemy. And alchemy is, again, it's symbolic and psychological. It's, it's an actual practical art, how it is psychological. And it's about purifying the world of its impurities. And this dream that Zosimos had uh, represents metals and other substances undergoing alchemical treatment in a lab. And the anthroparion is not an example of an artificial life, but it's symbolic in alchemy. It's metals turning into other metals. And this is why some scholars call the Anthroparion a pseudo homunculus. But the concept of this little man in a vial, the whole quote is he's talking to this little man in the vial who's talking to him. And, he, and this is when he sees him throw up his flesh and, and transform into something else. Alchemy for Zosimos was much more than an art. It was a religious experience. Uh, he was a follower of Hermes Trismegistus right? Because it was during the Gnostic era. And Hermes preached the very Gnostic idea that the world is a prison. The body is a prison for the soul. We are all here because of the archons. They're suppressing us. So the practice of alchemy to distill, purify matter from its dark attributes. Zosimos and his followers hoped to remove the impurity of matter. And the goal was to quote unquote, resurrect the material world. So when these guys were practicing this, they actually thought that they were affecting reality on a higher level by doing these things, by doing these arts, the alchemy, because not only was it a, a practical thing, it was also a spiritual thing for them. It's very cryptic. Like I said, the, uh, the history of, of alchemy goes from the thirds from Egypt. I mean, that's where the term comes Bro, from. I think there's some truth to it. I think that, I mean, think about the placebo effect, how our whole entire body can transform through a belief system, why wouldn't stuff like this work? In my opinion, that's what no, I think. Abso absolutely. Look at Kundalini. Kundalini is the belief that if you meditate enough, you are able to trigger a biological change within your body. The word mm. where the, you know, the serpent energy comes up and you change your DNA, your biological makeup through what? Through meditation. And that's mm. what a lot of people say that they try to suppress by demonizing yoga and demonizing all these things. Because it goes against the mainstream narrative of religion. I see it as a brokered experience. So the tr you can't get through God unless you go through the church and you have to pay your tithings. But then we're going to have this one guy. We're going to have a Hermes that's going to act as a messenger to talk to God for you. And we're going to put in a good word for you, bro. We're going to put in a good word for Donut. And we're, we might save you a seat in heaven if you're, if you're a good little boy. The world elite, whoever they are, they're doing these 
rituals. And if they're not elites, and let's just say they're just video music awards, <laughs> and that you could see that they're doing rituals at the Super Bowl, there's some sort of harvesting of energy. And if you call it like yoga, kundalini, but even Tai Chi, I don't understand how is uh, yoga like evil? Like this is a serious question, but Tai Chi isn't. I mean, it's like the same thing, but it's a martial art. So it's like, but people with Tai Chi masters, they're able to have like cannonballs hit them and they're able to not have it even affect their body. So there is stuff going on that I don't know what's going on. <laughs> the way I like to see the world is how Al-Kindi, which was an Arabic philosopher, he said that everything was light. Everything emanates light. And Al-Kindi inspired John D. by the way. He was he looked upon him and as like a god, right? He, uh, he took a lot of his ideas, but essentially he viewed everything as light. Like when we first did our podcast on Illuminati Confirmed, and then you start, because I've been trying to learn about homunculus, but I was calling it homunculus because I don't know anything. <laughs> so I was making these videos like homunculus, they're Johnny Depp trial, right? And you're yeah. like, it's homunculus. And then you said that there's more stages to the homunculus. That there's not just one that and i was just so oh, we're gonna I get into that bro we're gonna bro. learn some stuff today some dark stuff so essentially what al kindy was talking about was so he was a polymath he was this this guy who studied everything he talked about look and look at his school bro go back to his school what does it say their school aristotelianism aristotelianism so he even took ideas from aristotle <laughs> what we're talking about today Gotcha. So all these guys were inspiring themselves, but there's always those one guy, Pythagoras at the core of it. And from there, yeah, Aristotle, Daddy Pythagoras, <laughs> Daddy Pythagoras. And from there you have Plato and he paved the way for Christianity and the Gnostics came first. Christianity came after that. So these guys paved the way for what we know the world to be today. So Al Kindi talked about how we all emanate light. We're all these light beings. It reminds me eerily of what Crowley was saying that we're all, stars or something of that nature right well so, even this is Lieber. so Lieber, I, yeah right probably where Oster crowley got his Lieber idea uh, uh Lieber means book in in latin i believe novum is nine <laughs> yeah i right? don't know latin november, november can, is actually nine al kindy talked about how we're all light we all emanate light and the way our lights interact uh, creates an effect now the magician is the person who can manipulate those light, the light coming from everything. This mic is putting out light. The, that tree outside is putting out lights, interacting with my light and something else is going on. It's like this unseen world that is outside our vision. So it has to do with optics and all these things. And he believed that the people, the, what I consider the magicians are the people who can manipulate that light. Those are the people cr uh, creating magic where they're able to bend the light this metaphysical light and point it wherever they want and that's that i think that's what magic is and i love the alkindi worldview like just he imagine cool but it's like a cosmic too. web he looks like a boss too yeah bro these guys back then were on a such a, a a different level from today and it seems as we progress that people get stupider <laughs> No, I, don't, I didn't want to be mean, but yeah, sure. More ignorant, I guess. Bro, as time I, feel, goes on. I feel like I'm so stupid, dude. Like just the more I read about people back then and how smart they were and how they understood so much, spoke multiple languages. Well, you got to understand they weren't being influenced by everything else that's going on around us right now with technology, with school, the school system itself, what they put in these textbooks and all these things. That's part of the conspiracy, bro. That's why when people tell, oh, well, you know, I don't believe in conspiracies, bro. Uh, well, I, but I believe in God. That's the biggest, con religion is the biggest conspiracy of them all. What are you talking about, bro? So bro, people like tell I've me- I've always been questioning, like I grew up going to a uh, temple, Jewish. I grew up Jewish and I would always question mm -hmm. the rabbis and the rabbis would question me and were, and then I would question the school teachers and it was just always questioning. And I and think that's a good Boros. thing. Yeah. yeah, and I like to respect everybody's belief systems too, and I know that you do too. Like, I know you're not coming at it from a weird angle. A lot of people do. It's so weird. Like the mm -hmm. conspiracy movement, they try to like 
go yeah. after demonize people everything yeah and demonize yeah it's, and i'm just like part what? of the division it's part of the division and it's part of the the system to to be able to break everybody apart so if it's not this conspiracy it's the other conspiracy right we have flat earth and we have the globers and they're going out of war with each other does it matter at the end of the day you know what i mean so Right. And why can't list. there be a discussion about it? There like, can't. No. There can't. It's either no. the polar opposite. It's either you are or you're not. You can't be in between. It's like, well, I'm agnostic to it. Well, it doesn't matter, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got to pick a side. I want to get back into this homunculus because we have a lot to cover. <laughs> yes. Sorry. The first genuine homunculus. So uh, towards this time, we're at the fourth century AD. We still haven't seen the word homunculus in any writing, any literature, the actual word homunculus. The first mm. genuine homunculus, where it's the an artificial man for a magical purpose, is the story of Solomon and Absol. The original story is Greek, and it was in the 4th century AD, but in the mid-1400s, there was a Persian poet named Jami who took this story and made his own version. And you'll see that a lot of these stories throughout history, such as the story of creation and any other story, they all have their own version depending on their cultural influences of the time right and that's essentially right. what religion is the, you have the hindu story of creation you have the west story of creation or whatever you have the mesopotamian story of creation you have the egyptian story of creation depending on the cultural and geographical influences of the minds at the time there are various versions of the story that i'm about to tell but essentially it's about a king who is childless and he found sex with women repugnant so he didn't like he didn't want to uh women they're they're so uh you know so he didn't want to have sex and the king was sad and he had this mystic calicolas was his name and this was his advisor his counselor he had lived in a cave most of his life he practiced magic and he taught the king the secret sciences so we have this mystic this magician whatever you want to call him one of the secret sciences that he told that he gave to the king was abstaining from sexual intercourse to gain knowledge. So semen retention. Of, no uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, magical masturbation, whatever you want to call them. So he advised the king on creating a male heir by artificial means. And this is where it gets good. All he needed is what was the king's sperm and a vessel shaped like a mandragora, which is, have you, have you ever seen the, you pulled it up earlier where it's like the, the, that little the yeah, that looks like a man. So Mandragora, and it looks like a little, I, I think it's in, in one of the Harry Potter movies and all this stuff where when they pulled it, it screamed or something. I think, I believe that was it. Hmm. So in the, in the story, you start to see the, the evolution of sperm's role. There you go. In the story, they believe it was either one of those or a vessel, like an alchemical flask shaped like one of those. So they, they would take the sperm and put it in there. And you see the sperm's role in the creation of the, of the homunculus change throughout time. Because Caliculas didn't use menstrual blood. He only used the sperm because, again, it was seen as supernatural. And if it could do all these things, why not? Why do we need women? <laughs> why, you can't live with them. You can't live without them, right? He creates this homunculus, which he names Solomon. And... Solomon had a nurse that would take care of him and he ends up falling in love with this nurse, even though his father was like, Hey, you can't attach yourself to this material world. It's a very platonic idea of letting go. The Pythagoreans would let go of all of their belongings, all their material assets and turn it into the organization. And they would let go of all that to detach themselves from the material world. They wanted to ascend to a higher level without having to worry about the money in the bank, you know, how many cars you got, how many houses I got, none of that. It was strictly, yeah, I'm going to give it to the organization and I'm going to go take a vow of silence for five years. That's what the Pythagoreans did. They took a vow of silence for five years. And if you were to say one word, bro, you'd be dead to them. They would give you back your assets twofold and they would hold the funeral for you. And they would never talk to you ever again if you were to break that wow. vow of silence. Bro, wow. super brutal. Yeah, so super. he ends up... Yeah, <laughs> they they were hardcore, bro. They took these secrets. But they didn't have TV back then, so maybe it was easier. That's why, bro. It was all about learning. It was all about obtaining knowledge. It was about becoming this 
philosopher king, if you will. Like th that's why in Plato's Republic, it was about they needed a class of people to rule who didn't have any interest in society. They couldn't have kids. They couldn't benefit monetarily. They were there to hold the peace and rule society, which is, if you think about it, it's amazing because if you look at these politicians now, what are they doing, bro? They're corrupt as can be. So Plato was like, nah, let's take that out of the equation. They have to be eunuchs pretty much. You can't have sex. You can't do nothing. You're just going to rule society, right? You're going to have a group of them. So this Solomon goes to fall in love with his nurse, Absol. And his father was like, hey, don't do it. You know, don't attach yourself to this lower world. And Solomon's purpose, because he was a homunculus, remember this, was to ascend to the celestial regions between the physical world and spiritual realm. And he was to become a platonic sage for his father, right? In order to, uh, one who becomes righteous, holy, and wise. That's what he was, because when you make a homunculus, he does your bidding. He's supposed to do whatever you say and put it to do. And we're going to get into other things about uh, here coming up next, where it's going to get a little bit weird. We're going to have <laughs> sex with these things. Yeah, well, there you know. So uh, that's something else. But the, the idea of that you need to do the bidding of your creator. And oh, against the Solomon's dad's wishes, him and Absol, they, they go out, right? They, they leave the kingdom. And his dad finds them with, by magic and makes them impotent so they can't have kids. It's almost like a Romeo and Juliet type of thing where they try to drown themselves, but a water mm. spirit saves Solomon. But Absol dies. He's rescued by this water spirit. He goes back to his dad. And the mystic Caliculus is like, yo, bro, if you meditate with me for 40 days in a cave, I'll bring Absol back for you. Lo and behold, they're in this cave. They're doing this ritual. And Caliculus tries to invoke Aphrodite. And as he's invoking her, she's appearing. And she's very beautiful. And she appears to Solomon. And he forgets all about Absol, bro. He forgot about his other chick. He's like, yo, Aphrodite is beautiful. Right. And <laughs> there he forgets all about Absol and rejects all carnal love and assumes kingship, how his father always wanted, how the good little homunculus that he was. It's an allegorical story of rejecting the physical world for in favor of the, again, platonic world of forms. So Plato had this idea that there was an upper dimension and everything that was in there was perfect. And this is a reflection of a more perfect world. Right. These are we have a horse. And then you have the form of a horse, which is the perfect horse. But then the horses that populate this world are imperfect. They, they're, they're imperfect versions. If it hasn't gotten a little bit weird, it's about, we're about to crank it to 10, bro. And this is the, nice. this is the topic that, that got me into the homunculus, what really intrigued me. I have this other podcast called The Occult Book Club, where I team up with Paranoid American, Paranoid American Comics, check them out. We get together and we read obscure books in history and we review them and we give a, a, a full breakdown of the book on episodes. And one of the books that we came across was the Liber Vacay. How I mentioned earlier, we have the allegorical and the symbolic portrayals of the homunculus. It's time to get down and dirty, right? This idea of creating artificial life by the Islamic world was taken with open arms, bro. These guys were like, during the middle ages, were like, oh yeah, dude, we're going to do this whole thing. And you had two arms of I guess you could call it science arise and you had magia naturalis, which is natural magic and then alchemy during the middle ages. Those who were able to master nature uh, were seen to have extraordinary powers. They had, you know, there was divination that could change the course of the moon. They were omnipotent. That was the whole thing with Pythagoras. He was omnipotent. He could tell the future. He could, you know, because they understood nature, right? That's a natural magic books that would become known to be grimoires were instructions on magical practices, how to do something. Again, this gets convoluted with the magic and all this stuff, but the pseudo Galenic and Platonic grimoire that we're going to be covering is called the infamous Liber Vacate or the Book of the Cow. And I stumbled across this one night while reading some Manly P. Hall. And mm -hmm. it was a story, which I'll pull up here in a little bit to read it towards the end. It's a, a story about this Freemason who creates 10 different homunculus, homunculi, and he keeps them in his lodge, in his Freemasonic lodge. One of his assistants gets so annoyed by the homunculus that he kills them all because they were talking too much. But each homunculus had a different magical attribute, and we'll get into that story later. This book, you're not going to find it on Audible or Kindle because the original is in a very fragmented Arabic text and only exists in 
uh, various translations and the most popular translation being the Latin one, which the way I get my information was from a, a source that translated it. As you recall earlier, we talked about Aristotelian biology, spontaneous re uh, generation, and the sickening ritual of Begonia. And this book combines all of that and more. Now, this yeah. is where it's going to get. Just buckle up, all right, bro? So uh, the book is broken down into minor and major sections, and it consists of roughly 80 experiments. And there are recipes how to grow plants in an hour, methods to make armies, giants, and other forms appear in the sky. It also shows you how, and this is what really struck my interest, construct different magical houses where people were, will suffer epileptic, uh, epileptic seizures, start to tremble, hallucinate, or die. So it shows you how to make this perilous chapel type of thing in a house, right? It instructs you on how to be able to speak to birds or make lamps that can't be turned off. It gets really, I don't condone the animal abuse, but you got to understand that the elites are using the same magic that is written in these books today. So if they will do this to an animal, who knows what they'll do to a human, right? The Liber of AK can be traced back to the end of the ninth century. And it goes by various names here in the West, VK Platonis, Liber, Anaguimus, Liber. It's got a whole bunch of Legus Platonis, a whole bunch of different names. It's a pseudo-Platonic text where the person is Galen, which is a Roman physician, is talking about a work that Plato was supposedly wrote. But this is almost like having a pen name for the time. We know that Plato didn't write about this. We know Galen wasn't writing about this. These magicians of back then, these people who were writing these grimoires would use pen names. They would use like the Necromonomicon. Who wrote it? Well, we don't know, right? They say John D. Translated. There's a whole thing behind it. Well, who was it? Was it really some guy named Al Abdul Hazred? Probably not, right? That's a pseudonym. Frankenstein came out anonymously when that first came out. And it was totally... Percy Shelley, but they're yep. saying that it was Mary Shelley or whatever her name is. Percy Shelley wrote books anonymously on anti-church and sent it out to everybody. So yeah, the pen name. Yeah, absolutely. Again, this pen name to hide the fact that they were doing these things. Now, if it's right. symbolic for something much deeper within the text, I wouldn't be able to tell you. So it's a major and a minor. The minor section to the author says that it's known to the public. It's exoteric and it's various things, how to make optical illusions and all that stuff. And the major section he states is more noble, quote unquote, and esoteric in nature. So it's more specific, higher levels of magic. Now, the first four experiments of the major section are the macabre ones, right? The ones that we're going to be talking about, the ones that piqued my interest and of scholars and researchers and everybody alike. And these gruesome experiments, they even led some researchers to omit certain details from it. They were like, hey, you know, some things are better left unsaid because some of the things in this book get pretty sickening. It's like, wait, what you doing? What? So let, let's get to it, bro. In order to relate the relation between the cow and this book is called Liber Vacay, the book of cows. Uh, we're going to start with the fourth experiment of the major section that gives instruction on how to generate bees. Now that sounds familiar, right? Because we talked about Virgil and Begonia. You start off by taking a cow and building a house with 14 small windows on the eastern side. And when I think of this, I think about Abramelin and how Crowley, right? Abramelin's ritual on how to summon a guardian angel and how Crowley tried to do it. And he had to buy the bullskin house because it had the windows on a certain side and a certain amount of rooms and a certain orientation. Because again, I, I believe it goes back to light, bro. How they are able to bend light within these buildings and manipulate it and use it. So you start off by taking a cow, building a house. 14 small windows on an eastern side. And this could all be twilight language, but this is what this book says. Then you must seal off all of them shut. Behead the cow, drain all of its blood, and reattach the head back again. So far, so good. You then sew shut the mouth, eyes, ears, nose, anus, and vulva. And this is where it gets a bit weird if we haven't already. So similar to how Virgil beat his cow you're supposed to take the biggest dog penis you are able to find <laughs> and beat the cow with it so now i've had people do when i first covered this and i'm not 
I'm not lying. Some some scholars think that it was a mistranslation, but that's what it says. It says dog's penis. But the but not only is it a dog penis, it's the biggest one. Don't laugh, Donut. This is serious shit, bro. All right, this is serious stuff. Take the biggest one that you can find. And, and dude, I've had people listen to that episode because that episode like blew up. I've had people message me, telling me, asking me how to take care of their homunculus, how to make one, you know, how to find the biggest dog penis. I'm like, dude. Don't ask, I'm not your I'm not your guy. Don't come to me for this stuff because I don't know. You can get that information on the one and one Patreon. Go subscribe yeah. to his Patreon and you can get that info. I'm gonna make a Patreon tier about finding the biggest dog penis, the quest for the dog penis. So that's what people like, bro. People want that. I don't know, bro. When I came across this, I was really afraid. Like I told my co-host, I'm like, do you want to talk about it? He's like, Yeah, I'm game, bro. I'm I'm so about it. So I brought it up. So you take and this is quote, take a big dog penis and incessantly beat the cow with it <laughs> until its flesh is discolored and its bone is broker, broken. Now, wow. that's funny, right? It's, it's imagine, funny, yeah. Bah, just, ah, just going, just going to town. <laughs> yeah. on, and this isn't even the weirdest part, all right, bro? So after this step, you split open the, the cow skin after seven days and remove the marrow-like substance, which you must then grind up with an unknown herb. You take the mixture and put it in the corner of the house where it eventually becomes worms. Every day thereafter, you need to open a window and throw a handful of powdered bees at the worms until you have living bees. Now, if you do this in reverse, you get a cow. <laughs> so the whole step that I said you get a cow in reverse of this entire process. Bro, this is like Legos. Yeah, right. This is like esoteric Legos. Now, let's get to the homunculus recipes because this is the one that really piqued my interest. What pseudo-Plato calls a rational animal. And this, the experiment starts like this. And this is, quote, whoever wishes to make a rational animal should take his own water while warm, your own water, while warm, if you know what I mean, and let him mix it with an equal measure of stone that is called stone of the sun. This is a stone that shines at night like a lamp until the place in which it is found is illuminated. It's very cryptic. I think it's maybe a meteorite, like find a meteorite because meteorites glow, right? I don't know. It's like a color out of space type of thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a study where the powder of projection of alchemy was actually crushed meteorite. That's what they were using back then to transmit lead into gold. And after this, you take a cow or a ewe, which is a sheep. Its vulva is cleansed with medicines and its womb made capable of receiving what is to be put into it. Now, if a cow is used, the blood of the ewe is put on its vulva and vice versa. And if a, and if a ewe is used, you put the, cow, the blood of the cow on the vulva. The orifice is then plugged with the stone of the sun. After this, the animal is put in a dark house and every week it is given a pound of the other animal's blood to eat. One must then take some of the sunstone, as much sulfur, as much magnet and as much green tuchia. I guess that's how you say it, tutia. He should grind them, mix with willow sap, dry in the shadows. When the cow or sheep gives birth, one must take that form and put it in that powder that you just made of the willow sap and all that stuff. And then when you put it in there, it's going to get human skin. This is the homunculus. You take that human skin covered gelatinous thing now and you put it into a great glass or lead vessel. And after three days, it's going to become hungry and it's going to start moving around. This is our homunculus, right? You're going to start feeding it the blood from the decapitated mother for seven days. This is what pseudo-Plato calls the animal form that is agreeable to many miracles will be finished. And this being can be used to change the course of the moon, change oneself into a cow or sheep, and if you take this shape and you nourish it for 40 days and feed it blood and milk, nothing else, and the sun does not see it, you may use its bodily fluids to anoint your feet and you'll be able to walk on water, bro. Finally, if a man, and this is quote, if a man has raised it and nourished it until a whole year passes and left it in milk and rainwater, it will tell him all things that are absent. Walking on water sounds very specific, right? Who walked on? Oh, Jesus walked on water. It was he using a homunculus? I don't know. Was he a homunculus? We'll get to that later because, like I said, it's going to get really weird on this episode if it hasn't gotten weird. And I have the remaining other experiments of this book. 
So essentially, it's telling us the purpose of a homunculus is to use it for magical purposes. So you make it, uh, you dissect it, you use its bodily parts for magical. It gives you god godlike powers, bro. That's what that's what a homunculus is. Dude, this could be working. I mean, I've never done that. I, do you know anyone who's actually done that? Like, it could be. That's what's up. Like, maybe that is what's going on. You know, like I'm never gonna be able to do that because I. <laughs> can't build furniture for my kid how can i even make it a homunculus but this you know fascinating, can... bro and when i laugh it's because i'm really enjoying it bro it's funny and it's... and and bro i like i talk on my channel a lot about sex rituals mm. and all the time and every time i bring on someone um and bring up this stuff they they like they tell me to take it out of the podcast and like, stuff like that and i'm just like what like this was going on like so i i wasn't like laughing in any disrespect at all just, all good, bro. I just like i just I, the words tickle my mind when it's funny, you bro. talk about beating some of the, the biggest dog penis it's so specific exactly it's like how do you know you have the biggest dog dick? like what if you use this dog dick and then you go find another dog that's got a bigger dick than the original one you're like what's going on so right i get it bro and mind you it could be green language who knows? Because these guys were cryptographers. They talked in, in, in this twilight language. So it could be a hidden code within the code, bro. With, you know, the, the actual answers might be behind. You know, it's not a dog dick. It's 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 something else. Right. It's, it's code word for something. But we don't have the key to understand it. Right. Like, it's we're just esoteric. Here. Exactly. The next two experiments are essentially the same thing, except the matrix. The womb is provided by a female monkey in one. And in the third the womb is an un unidentified animal. So for, for to, to recap, the generation of the bees was the fourth and final experiment on the ones that are like weird. And then the one that I just said was the, the second. And now we're going to get into the third and the fourth. An ointment made from the eyes and brain of the homunculus birthed by the monkey allows you to see spirits and demons and drinking a brew made from its tongue allows you to talk to the demons, right? Using its liver makes trees bend over using its brain and the brain of a fresh human corpse. So you have to kill a person on a dead tree, makes it come back to life instantly using the guts of the homunculus birthed by the un unidentified animal can make you impervious to pain using its heart wrapped in a skin of its forehead makes you invisible. So the heart wrapped in the skin of its forehead makes you invisible and burning powder made from its body can make it rain. And finally, if you bury that powder for 14 days, the powder will give you birth to a extremely poisonous snakes. There's an other sets of experiments as well, because there's 80 in total. And there's one on how to, how to generate hybrid animals, such as a cow with a human face, viper-like worms with horns and enormous eyes, bee-like worms, a final animal that if you use its fat as an ointment can permanently transform you into a pig or an ape. Now, I don't know what that means, but apparently if you rub this stuff on you, you turn into a pig or an ape. As the experiment progress, as the experiments progress, it's just more mixtures of bodily fluids. So more and more animal and human substances and mixed in various, various matrices. So my, one could be a sheep vagina, another one can be a cow vagina, another one can be a horse, and it gives you different chimeras. David Pingree, which is a scholar and a researcher, he considered the Liber Vacay as, quote unquote, the most flagrantly demonic Arabic books on magic. And he said that the homunculus was an artificial demon of some sorts. The experiments in the Libre Vake are considered natural magic and not so much astral. And the difference between that is you, you have Goetia and you have all these other things where you use entities to do the magical stuff, right? So this entity gives you invisibility. This other entity gives you can walk on water. This other entity can do this, you know, X, Y, Z. Well, this is natural magic. You're using nature in a concoction made from nature to make these magical feats. So it's not... This guy thought it was, you are making a, a homunculus this is an actual demon. If you see in full, I don't know if you watch anime, but the Full Metal Alchemist, well, the bad guys, they're who? They're homunculus. They're all homunculus. You have the, Frankenstein is a little bit different, but the idea of the homunculus is seen all throughout, bro, sh TV shows, kids shows, animations, movies. There's a, there's a movie on Netflix called Homunculus, and it's about this Japanese guy that can see people's essence for what it really is it's really trippy everything had the illuminati eye in that show which i i yes. didn't look too much into it but 
I thought Bro, that was... anime is a cult AF dog. If you watch any anime, there's there's so much occult symbolism, and, and you know the Full Metal Alchemist, which is what we're talking about in that. In, spoiler alert! In that story, the their their chase because alchemy is chasing the philosopher's stone, uh, where it's this stone that gives you eternal life, right? The elixir of life. It, it, it turns lead into gold. It, it's the it's the magnum opus of the alchemist. From what I've read, creating le uh, gold from lead is actually a byproduct. They're not actually after that. They're actually after being able to manufacture life, to make artificial life, to become a god in a, in a, in a sense, to become a demiurge over life. That's based on a manga too, I believe. Look, he's covering his eyes, so that's Illuminati right there, bro. Illuminati confirmed. Illuminati confirmed. There you go right there. <laughs> the, the, this idea of the homunculus goes back way, way into antiquity and it's in religion. Now, ultimately, these experiments are for the purpose of the magician, the person practicing these things in this grimoire, this magical book to have godlike powers. There's the debate whether it is a demon or not, because back then, this idea that women were only seen as incubators for the sperm. There's an idea that if you look at the story of Merlin from the tale of Arthur, he's a homunculus because he was created from a woman and a, su a succubi. I think that's how you say it or in incubus, a succubus, sorry, a succubus inserted the sperm into Merlin's mom. So he's Whoa. half demon and half woman and half human so he's like a demi demon i guess you could call it that's why he has magical powers and that idea that demons suscubus and incubuses could steal man's sperm was a big thing back then bro it was a real big thing that these demons could that's why they practice chastity and all these different things of like not having sex and abstaining from sex because they believe that demons could go in the night and steal men's sperm and deposit it into themselves Anything could be a womb back then. If you demean the woman as being the, the one that creates life, which we know today from science that women are actually the ones that create life, right? They're the, they're the reason why we're here. <laughs> it's like, who came first, the chicken or the egg? But these guys back then didn't know that. They had big egos. Science wasn't. So there you go, the demons impregnating Merlin's mom. That's wild, bro. I had no idea. And that's King Arthur, bro. That's his, that's his mentor. Merlin is the mentor, bro. That's wild. So this idea that demons could insert seed, man's seed because it's all powerful and all and supernatural into women is a is a thing, bro. Look at that. That's a painting from what the 1494. What is that? It's freaky, bro. And then the one before this. Look at the demon on the left. Yeah. Oh, dude, I got oh, some pictures on the right. <laughs> they're like cutting up the animals. They're cutting the goats. They're there you go. The yeah. homunculus in it. So, again, ultimately, it's about having godlike powers as a magician. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. Jabir Abin Hayyan. He was an 8th century Persian sage that was referred to as the Paracelsus of the Arabs. This is 8th century, so uh, 16th century was Paracelsus. And in his works, Hayyan wrote about and gave instructions on how to artificially recreate products of nature such as precious metals, stones, plants, animals, and you guessed it, man. Hayan argued that you could not only mimic God in his creation, which is what man has always wanted to do, right? the Tower of Babel, they wanted to reach the heavens and all these different stories, the Garden of Eden, they wanted to eat from where God said not to eat. Not only could, could you mimic God in his creation, but you could also produce beings never seen before. And I think this is where they, they were trying to find the idea of you, you see all these chimeras back then, you know, you have harpies, you have minotaurs, you have centaurs, you have all these, right. That they talk about being Nephilim descendants where it's right. like the, when the Nephilim were done with the women, they started to insert themselves into animals and make these abominations. And I think that's what they were trying to uh, account for. They're like, where does that come from? Well, it's, you know, creations that you've never seen before. And of course it's at a, at the core of it, it's sperm because it's Aristotelian thought. Hayan would said to put it in various molds that were detachable. So think about a mold of a little person with detachable arms, head, legs. And he would put it in this contraption that I labeled the homunculus rotisserie machine, 
where it was this machine that he you would secure the mold in and it had concentric circles. And it was a machine where it was just the concentric circles just spinning around. And that was meant to emulate the and mimic the cosmic system, right? The, the, the way that the, that the, the universe worked. And depending on the shape and size of the molds determine the outcome of the homunculus that you were going to get. So it would vary from a young girl with a boy's face to an adolescence with the intelligence of a man. Hayan goes on because, again, we see this idea of magic and creating man transform since the very beginning. Hayan goes on to say that there's different schools, quote unquote, for different methods on how to use the sperm for different homunculi. So, for example, if you were to create, if you wanted to create a winged man, you would mix the sperm of a man and a bird, and then you would get a winged homunculi. Or vice versa, if you wanted to get, you know, a man with a cow's foot or whatever. Well, and, and there was all these quote unquote schools of thought that would, look, he's the father of modern day chemistry. That, that guy, this guy right here, bro, this guy, and they were occultists. Isaac Newton was an occultist. All these guys were in the occult. That's why I believe in symbolism recognition where I've been called an armchair occultist because I don't practice anything, but I want to learn about these things because I want to be able to identify them if they come up somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, what is the, what is the one eyed symbol mean? Well, it means X, Y, Z. It's like, why are they putting that out there? Well, you know, they're trying to imprint the, the subconscious on, on a, I mean, on a cosmic level, if you will. Right. I have here the Jewish golem. And the Jewish golem is a little bit different because it's not our traditional homunculus. Yes, I'm interested in this. I want to know about this because this I just did a video on Frankenstein. I didn't get to go into the golem, so I didn't get to research it. So I'm really excited. You have uh, you have the, the Pokemon there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just I just I, there's a Google. That's what pops up. The pocket monster Pokemon. This relates to Jack Parsons, bro, what I'm about to talk about. And it relates to John D. And it relates to a lot of other people, uh, Crowley and all these guys. And this is how far back they go. The Golem of Prague is one of the most, more famous, if not the most famous story that involves Rabbi Judai Lowe Ben Bezalel. And he is from the 16th century. And he's the one that made, created the Golem out of clay to defend the Jewish ghetto from attacks of Rudolph II. Both of which John D. met, allegedly. John D. met with Ju uh, Rabbi Judai Lowe and Rudolph II. The angels told him to go visit Prague and tell Rudolph II that he was uh, possessed by demons. <laughs> so wow. both of these guys, Prague was seen as a very magical place, bro. You know, a place that, that held a lot of magic. A lot of the transmutations that were done by Edward Kelly were done at Prague. So Prague is like this weird paganistic place that, that holds a lot of magic. Essentially the story is about the magical power of the Hebrew language and its origins can be traced back to the Sefer Yetzirah, which is a book attributed to the biblical Abraham. And the, the text pretty much uh, talks about how God created the cosmos from the letters. You have the Tetragrammaton and all these things in there, right? The, the four lettered, name of god right. right the different names of god and in this story go ahead tetragrammaton i got to jordan maxwell got to school me on the tetragrammaton yes it's it's magic so it's, it's related to the cube and braxis and all this stuff in the story the word amet meaning truth was written on the uh, golem's forehead and every sabbath in order to let the golem quote unquote rest the e from amet would be yeah. erased and it would form met, which meant death. So the golem would come down and, and, and die, essentially. He was, he was the, the phoenix. He was Prometheus, that every day he would have to come back, right? So it's all symbolic to the same things that from the gods of antiquity that we're talking about. Mind you, these are religions that sprouted from Aristotle, Pythagoras, all these other people way before their time. One night, Rabbi Lowe forgot to do this, and the golem went on a rampage. He started through the ghetto, and he started destroying everybody, killing people. There's various versions of this story, how I mentioned earlier. But eventually, Rabbi Lowe would be notified, and he would be able to subdue the golem, killing it. He would be able to erase that, that letter from its forehead. And it was stored in an attic in a synagogue in Prague, where it, was, where it stayed for centuries, where they say that it was there for a long time. Although the story of the golem differs from our traditional homunculus, Paracelsian scholar Walter Pagel 
argues that the golem was the predecessor to Paracelsus homunculus because all this time we're in the 16th century and we still haven't seen the word homunculus appear in any literature until we get to Paracelsus. Before we get there, I want to make a quick pit stop. The golem is more of like an automata, like a robot or like a cybernetic or an AI being, if you will, like a cosmic AI being. It doesn't speak. It's very dumb if you know for lack of a better term and but it does the bidding of its owner right but he went out of control so you have a frankenstein in there where it goes out of control and it needs to be subdued well what's the whole thing behind ai in the matrix right the matrix being womb in the in the movie the matrix they are creating homunculus within this artificial lab laboratory setting where neo when he wakes up he is a homunculus in the matrix Right. He was created for one purpose, for the purpose of harvesting data or energy or whatever it was in the movie. So you can see the the golem as some sort of automata, like a robot it only does what it's programmed to do. It can't really do anything else. It's kind of dumb. And that's all it can really do. It doesn't really have any other special powers. But this is the first time where they didn't want to kill the, the homunculus. Right. There's this weird aspect of having to kill the homunculus in order to do what you wanted to do. Well, the golem, they really didn't need to kill it. They, you know, they just needed to put it under control. And this is where it gets a bit heretical. On the topic of religious magic, because that's what a golem is, it was meant to show off the power of the Hebrew language, the tetragrammaton and, and the power of word and letters. Jesus Christ being a homunculus was an idea in the 15th century, bro. Uh, Spanish theologian Alonso Tostodo, Tostado, I'm sorry, Tostado, it's Spanish. So Tostado sounds like toasted in Spanish. And Thomas Aquinas, a theologian and a doctor of the church. And these guys were going at each other, but they were writing papers. And Alonso was writing about paradoxes in religion, how things were. It's like, wait, so he was bro, he was calling people out of the Bible. Like, why did you say this in this book? And in this other book, you have a paradox. Like, you know, you guys are, there's conflicting stories here. Tostado proposed that Mary was a sealed vessel again there's it's a variation from our traditional homunculus because there's no semen she was a, she was virgin mary but she did have menstrual blood and a womb and although tostala argued that mary would not have had enough blood for a full development of jesus in the womb therefore he was a condensed version of a man so she didn't have enough blood in her body for him to fully develop so essentially he would have had to been a miniature version of a, little, of a little baby. So according to Aristotelian biology and the alchemical process, Jesus was conceived as a homunculus, a miniature human kept in a sealed vessel for the first instant of creation. And you can clip that for a clip because I'm sure I don't know if anybody's ever said that on a podcast. But Aquina argued that there was no need for sperm because the Holy Spirit was infinitely powerful and can fashion matter into form instantly. So we have this meta again, back to religious magic, where this metaphysical aspect of the religion is playing a role into the birth of this Messiah. That's a very heretical idea that Jesus was a homunculus. But I take it a step further because I said, yeah, this makes a lot of sense to me. And coming from a Christian background, Tostado would go on to present the repercussions of creating homunculus. So what he didn't want is the, de the demeaning of the womb, right? It's a sacred thing. It creates life. And essentially what he didn't want was the status of mother to be demeaned to demoted to just mean flask or container or something, which makes sense, right? It's like, don't demean some, especially now something that's beautiful childbirth i have kids i don't know about you but we you know childbirth and all these things that's a beautiful thing and women are at the core of that now now we've learned because of science whatever that is nowadays that women are the ones that actually make things happen the idea of a homunculus goes against the views of the church because this is something else that i didn't think about because this gets philosophical the idea of a homunculus gets philosophical because if god died for your sins did he die for the sins of that homunculus that you just created? Does it have a soul? Does it have a spirit? Tostalo talked about this other guy, Arnold of Villanova. The Ar Arnaldian homunculus legend comes way, you know, it was another idea that came forth where this guy, bro, was making homunculus. And before God might infuse a rational soul into the conceived, the homunculus, he would kill it. So he would make a homunculus, 
And then as soon as it came to life, he would just smash it. Boom. He would just kill it. Cause he's like, I don't know if God's going to possess it with like a spirit. God didn't die for that spirit in particular. Cause according to the church, you know, God died for our sin. But if I'm creating artificial, there's like a gray area. These guys were trying to be philosophical with the, with the repercussions of what, what an entitled would, if you make a homunculus, like, do you have to give it a social security number or what, how does that work? Essentially kids are homunculus, I guess. I, I don't, I don't know, but you know, there's the aspects of the soul and then Car Rene Descartes comes in there with the mind body dualism and the, you know, what is consciousness? I think therefore I am. Well, does the homunculus think, bro, this thing goes way deep and the way I see it, bro, I think that Jesus might've been a homunculus because if you notice the idea that you need to kill the homunculus in order to achieve some sort of magical power. What do we see in the story of Jesus Christ? He is crucified, but not only that, he is crucified and the church cannibalizes his body symbolically. What do we do in the Eucharist? You're partaking of the body and the blood of Christ. So you're essentially eating the homunculus' blood, which is a sacred thing because you feed the homunculus blood. And you're eating the body for what? For enlightenment, for for what? For you to invoke this salvation, pretty much. That's what you that's a magical thing. So you can go to heaven and ascend this dimension. So the idea of Jesus being a homunculus is not out of the question. It is another version, like the golem of a homunculus. The same Aristotelian idea. Constantine was the one that in the Council of Nicaea and the canon and non-canon, they're the ones that essentially, the Holy Roman Empire were the ones that essentially implemented these ideas. Don't you think that they knew about the homunculus of Aristotle? We're going to wrap up here. We have the the daddy Paracelsus or the hermaphrodite Paracelsus. There's a, there's a bunch of conspiracies con <laughs> concerning this individual. Philippus Ariolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, Paracelsus, right? They, they, they had to shorten up his name. They're like, this guy's name. That was his long. real name? That was his real name, bro. Oh, there it is. Damn. Yeah, that's crazy. So, a.k.a. Paracelsus in the 16th century. I got to memorize that. Yeah. Theophrastus von Hohenheim. You can, yeah, just. Philippus Arolus Theorastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, you mean? <laughs> Hohenheim. <laughs> Hohenheim. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, it's crazy. He, he looked goofy, dude. So he was, check this out. He was 5'3. He was 5'3. He the, was a monkey. He, well, he was the father of toxicology and he, he coined the term, the quote, the dose makes the poison. So imagine this guy. He was the one that came up with the idea that if you took too much of a medicine, it would kill you. And if you took just the right amount, it would make you feel better so imagine this guy bro back then just taking psychedelics or taking some sort of poison <laughs> and just right. poisoning himself trying to figure out again these are the times 16th century bro and they, this is how they were able to figure things out through boots on the ground research and doing unorthodox things of their time and without these people like paracelsus who hated sex and was allegedly a, tr a drunk he he was he he viewed women as uh, monstrosities and we're going to get into that right now because they're a product of his time but there's a conspiracy that he was actually a hermaphrodite and he was there's other conspiracies that he was he was a eunuch and he was castrated and there's another conspiracy that he said that he was actually a woman with a huge clit and lips that look like a small ball sack and that was not me that is actual research that i came across wow. <laughs> of paracelsus man and like... it's backed up by anatomy they have his skeleton and they were able to study his skeleton and they were able to come up with the fact that he had wider hips than usual he was five three he, he does look like my grandma <laughs> cranial deformities <laughs> and uh, allegedly he admitted to somebody about being again uh he he liked men who but who knows you, you know what i mean it doesn't matter it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, he was a great mind of his time if he was into some weird stuff he was because he was talking about homunculus. This is the man or person who coined the term homunculus. This is the daddy of the homunculus by the name, by and, name. Yeah, and the daddy of the toxo, toxic. Uh, yeah, toxicology. You know, toxicology. This guy is a very important, and I'm yeah. just making jokes, you know. <laughs> so the homunculus to Paracelsus was the pinnacle of man's creative power. 
the idea that man could become a god, how I had mentioned earlier, essentially a demiurge. In 1572, physician Adam von Bodenstein, he published a book that was supposedly by Paracelsus, the Natura Rerum. And this is a very famous book. And in this, in this book, there's an argument that things are either created by means of nature without art or with the aid of art, which is alchemy. And Paracelsus is the one that brings, he is the one that brought forth the idea of the egg, this phlegm. I'm not going to try and say the other word, like this mucus membrane, the phlegm that's inside the egg, right? Uh, that, that would putrefy and that would bring forth the chick, the baby chick. We know that's wrong now, but this is what these guys thought. He was the one that came up with that idea. And he also stated <laughs> that if you were to burn that bird or chick into a powder, and insert its ashes into the phlegm and put that into a horse womb or subject it to the warmth of a quote unquote horse womb, you would get a quote unquote renovated and restored bird. So homeboy is got it kind of mixed up. You know, I have that book, the devil's doctor when he just passed. So he's talking about how if you take that bird and you burn it and you put it back into the egg that you're going to get some sort of a Phoenix, which we know is wrong too. The nature de natura rerum, he goes on to say that the death and rebirth of birds is quote unquote, the highest and greatest magnali and mystery of God, the highest secret and wonder work. It goes on to say, quote unquote, you must also know that men too may be born without natural fathers and mothers. That is, they are born from the female body in natural fashion as other children are born. But a man may be born and raised by means of art and by the skill of an experienced spadurist, as in show hereafter. This is him introducing the homunculus. He also talks about the unnatural union of man with beast, which also produces offspring, though not without heresy, because we know bestiality is a thing. Nowadays, there's people who like to get have sex with animals. We know back then it was a thing. The Nephilim were doing it. The Nephilim were inserting themselves into animals and have I don't you know seen if you've the movie zoo? the death of dick long have you seen zoo <laughs> no no but there's a movie called the death of dick long uh, well that's the same thing where the dude uh dies because he got perforated by the horse yeah 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 <laughs> yeah so there's people who do this stuff okay this is not this is this is taboo but people there's a reason why it's taboo right and he dubbed these things monsters uh paracelsian monsters an example of a Paracelsian monster before we get to the actual homunculus is the creation of a basilisk. If you've never heard of a basilisk, it's a mythological creature, almost like a dragon. Have you heard of this headless man? Uh, yeah, in Lemuria or something like that. I just yeah. saw like people posting it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know if this is connected to any of that because it's well, in a it bunch could of be. Well, so Paracelsus believed that giants of back then were spreading their seed all throughout the world. And wherever that seed would land would form a giant or a, a monstrosity of some sort. So he did believe that at one point in time. He, was, he would talk about it in his writings. He talked about the dualistic nature of sperm, how when man is in lust and this bestial nature comes out in man, that that pollutes the sperm. And whatever is... Whenever that sperm is put into a woman, that's actually a soulless being. Well, this is Paracelsus talking. This is the daddy of all of that. The guy who came up with all these ideas talking about how you could pollute your sperm. And it just makes me think of NPCs where these soulless sperm, like, are yeah. they the NPCs that we see who are just here for texture? You know, like, like some weird, per I don't know. I'm not trying to be mean, but. My friend works at the mall and she says that in the morning, she's not into conspiracies or anything. She's like, she's explaining an NPC. She's like, these people I don't think are, are real. Not that they don't have feelings and live, but they're like robots. They're like NPCs that are just program walking. And I'm like, you should go up to them and be like, Hey, and just see what <laughs> happens. <laughs> yeah. I did a whole episode on NPCs on my channel where I got into the whole thing and it's, I want to show show people your channel real quick, just uh, while you're on that on video screen, how you got some amazing podcasts. I'm on the most recent one, Illuminati Confirm, and we Don't go. Into, nut. <laughs> yeah, we go into a little bit of the homunculi, but nothing like this. 
Oh yeah, here's the MPC one with Plato's Cave. Oh, that's gonna be great. I'm listening to that tonight. But I mean, you got a ton of work, ton of work done, and you do your research. So uh, everybody, you got. I'll have all the links down below for you, everyone to subscribe. Yeah, I appreciate that, bro. Yeah, you can find anywhere. You can find your podcast. I got a YouTube channel too. I post a video version of it on there. I'm trying to be like you, bro. So yeah, but I, I love doing deep dives and just learning and bringing new ideas to the game and uh, about different topics from a, as scholarly as I can get. I consider myself a scholar. I consider myself a sage that's looking for the wisdom. And I like to back my ideas up with research. I like to say crazy things and I like it better when I can back it up with even more. The truth is stranger than fiction. Bro, bro we're so. on the same page, bro. <laughs> so I'm so grateful for you, bro, coming on here and, diving yeah, deep sure. and dude this has been awesome but continue the basilisk i don't know if you've heard about it it's a mythological creature that you can't look at it or else it kills you it's almost like a like a serpent dragon it's you can relate it to to medusa right where she turns everything to stone so paracelsus talked about how to make one of these things and this is where it gets a little bit misogynist and he talks about the creation of the basilisk from the menstrual blood of a woman that's sealed up in a flask and heated to the temperature of a horse's room. So what he would do is he would put this in a jar and he would stick it in horse poop because it was warm, right? Fresh horse that he would put in there so it would, it would cook it up and putrefy. Now, the basilisk is considered the monster, and this is, these are his words, the monster above all monsters because its glance can kill just like the glance of a menstruating woman who quote, who has also hidden poison in her eyes and can ruin mirrors with her gaze, make wounds impossible to hear and spoil wine with her breath. The basilisk was the embodiment of the woman's impurities and their poisonous essence. The, these are his words. Misogynist didn't like sex, right? Maybe he couldn't get some, bro. Who knows? He hated women. And we see this in his work, the basilisk, this thing that you can't look at. It's horrible. It's made from menstrual blood. After explaining how to create the basilisk, the basilisk he describes the homunculus, how to create the homunculus. And he describes it in, in detail, which is essentially the masculine opposite of a basilisk. So it's this enlightened man, this, this higher being, this, this, this thing that's it's a more of a spiritual thing for him that's why i go back to the whole idea of are they talking in green language or are they actually talking about something that's real we must now by no means forget the generation of homunculi and these are his words and this is the first time that the word homunculus comes into literature the first time we see it for there is something to it although it has been kept in great secrecy and kept hidden up to now and there was not a little doubt and question among the old philosophers whether it can even be possible to nature and art that a man can be born outside the female body and without a natural mother i give this answer that is by no means opposed to the spagyric art and to nature but that is indeed possible but how this should happen and proceed its process is thus that the sperm of a man is putrefied by itself in a cucurbit for 40 days with the highest degree of putrefaction in a horse's womb, or at least so long that it comes to life and moves itself and stirs, which is easily observed. After this time, it will look somewhat like a man, but transparent without a body. If after this, it is fed wisely with the acronym of human blood and be nourished for up to 40 weeks and be kept in an even heat of the horse's womb, a living human child grows therefrom with all its members like another child, which is born of woman, but much smaller. So we have the first mention of homunculus by Paracelsus himself. Homunculi are magical. And the homunculus is pure because it hasn't been tainted by the quote unquote poisonous mixture. How the basilisk was <laughs> the menstrual blood, the woman's essence, the homunculus, according to Paracelsus that reaches adulthood is said to become a marvelous being like a giant or a dwarf. So maybe this is how we get mythological beings. They have supernatural strength and they know all things hidden and, and secret things. And why is that? Why does this homunculus, this little being know everything? It's a fortune teller. You can use its body for magical purposes. They receive, and this is quote, they receive their life from art. Through art, which is alchemy, they receive their body, flesh, bone, and blood. 
Through art they are born, and therefore art is embodied and inborn in them, and they need learn it from no one. So this idea, again, this philosophical idea that this homunculus is art embodied. So it therefore knows everything about the world of forms. It goes back to this platonic thought, this demiurgic thought, where it goes back to Aristotle all the way to the beginning of that time. And it's here in the 16th century by Paracelsus that was the one that really made it the most famous. He writes about this in the De Homunculus, which is another book that he wrote, where he states that man has, that, what I was telling you, this dualistic nature to him and, and, and the, the tainting of the sperm and all this stuff. And this to him was uh, some sort of experience. It was the pinnacle of being able to create life. You have other people who talk about, well, it's actually the opposite because man is only able to do what? To reproduce artificial versions of a real thing. Wouldn't it be the opposite of the highest pinnacle? Wouldn't it be the bottom of the barrel? Because you're just creating a knockoff version of a human life, right? Essentially. So you have that, those two schools of thought when it comes to the idea of the homunculus. And I wanted to relate this to occultists of today they're reading these same things don't they? they're looking at the same grimoires they're looking at all the same information and they're taking it and they're putting it a step above they're adding their own magical experiments their own magical systems like parsons and enochian magic they're stepping their game up the idea is to manifest as quickly as you can with the least amount of work the jewish golem is related to jack parsons parsons his mentor at the JPL was supposedly a descendant of Ju uh, Rabbi Judai Lo, the original guy who made the golem in Prague. This guy would brag about it, about how he was related in the same lineage of this, this guy. And we know that Parsons was doing sex magic mm -hmm. in the desert with L. Ron Hubbard, and they were trying to bring forth what I would consider a homunculus, the same thing in the story of Aleister Crowley in the moon child, this magical child, the idea of sex magic and all that stuff. I'm sure you've gone into it, but they yep. are able to infuse powers, archetypes, energies into this baby. We see these movies all the time where, oh, it's the son of the Antichrist, Rosemary's baby. What was all that about? It was a movie about a wait. So the guy was also allegedly raping a woman too, right? Like he went to, he, they wanted to imprison him for doing what he was telling a story about. You know what I mean? So these guys infuse fiction with reality all at the same time. And I think that's the revelation of method that they use where they put it out as hey, it's a story. <laughs> it's a story, right? It's a movie. It's great. It looks awesome. And in actuality, they're doing this behind closed doors. They're doing these same exact things that we're reading about. And if they're able to do this gruesome stuff to an animal, like how they do in the Libra Vacay, what wouldn't they do to a person? And it just makes me think of what if that cow was actually from another ritual that that magician had done and turned the person into a cow and is just using that cow for the new ritual. Because there's, it tells you how to turn somebody into a monkey or, or, or a sheep or, an, or a cow. If you take the homunculus and you do what... The idea that pigs are maybe humans, right? There's, the, there's that conspiracy too, where pigs are actually cloned humans, right? <laughs> we have Most a bunch of butchers don't eat pig. Exactly. We have the idea that exactly the, the religious belief that they don't eat pigs, but we have people who go missing all the time. Do the missing 411, are they actually going into hollow earth? Or are they actually being abducted? Are they being turned into, yeah. In order for us to cannibalize cows. them. Yeah, exactly, bro. Right, so right. this goes And then you got all the cow deep. mutilations too. I mean, I just playing that together, right? I mean, that's happening mm. like a month ago. There was the a skinwalker. The the skinwalker, the Watigo, the the Watico and all these things are considered you can consider them homunculus because uh, a skinwalker, there's a ritual that goes behind becoming a, a skinwalker. There's a ritual that goes behind becoming a Watico. You have to do a, a, a ritual of killing one of your own 
or invoking the skinwalker is more of a thought form, but even that could still be considered a homunculus of some sort. And and Jack Parson was killed um, when he was doing some lab experiment. Maybe that was for him to turn into like a skinwalker or something like that. I didn't know that about skinwalkers. There was a, the conspiracy is that he blew himself up. The, the mainstream is he blew himself up handling explosives. Now there's, there's some inconsistencies there because the blast came from underground and it folded the, the floorboards up. Some people say that he was messing with a fire elemental. Some people say that he was making homunculus and he, exp- he exploded himself. And the idea comes from when he was doing the sex magic with, with, Oh, Ron Hubbard, where he's trying to invoke the whore of Babylon. Allegedly, when Marjorie Cameron came, she was pregnant and she was supposedly they used that. She aborted it and they used that fetus and gave it to the government. And the government took that and did whatever they were doing with it. They were seeing if it was magical or not because it was made under magical circumstances, under a sex ritual magic. They, they had sex for like two weeks or something like that. And also the connection of the Trinity site where allegedly in the big gumbo or whatever the name of that big capsule was within that they were trying to make a homunculus through radioactivity when they blew it up they wanted to see if it would affect whatever it was in there and that's uh, by michael hoffman he talked about that in his book wow. i'm not able to confirm that information but also but- like it just makes sense because the atomic bomb was created and they wrote a book about it and they called it American Prometheus and it was this guy Oppenheimer. Really? Yeah. So this, and it's a movie that's coming out like this month and we're hearing about all this nuclear stuff, but mm. it's called Oppenheimer. They Oppenheimer. wrote a book about it and it was called American Prometheus. So like, yeah. So well, like there's the creepy, there's the creepy video of him. One of my favorite quotes by him where they, they look him in the eyes and Oppenheimer's like, I have now, you know, he quotes the Mahabharata where he goes, I have now become the destroyer of worlds. And what it, you know, you see that symbolism where uh, either Vishnu come, becomes the full, the, the, the multi-armed form. You see that in CERN, bro, with the, with the Shiva in front of, of CERN. And Kali is the, the opposite of that. And I relate that to Margie Cameron had a cult where they were trying to make an interracial star child an interracial homunculus and they think that they thought they were bringing forth this new era of people alistair crowley i'm sure he was doing that too so all the greatest occultists uh that of of all time probably were messing with this and they were doing these same things and they were stepping it up uh, at a higher level and we see stories again all throughout how you looked up in the media with with the movies about homunculus and the mangas infusing this idea, the Frankenstein being also some sort of a homunculus and, and all these ideas. Statues coming to life are uh, also could be considered homunculus. I'm sure because there's ancient stories, how statues started become coming to life. It's funny. You mentioned this. This is a very esoteric book by one of my favorite authors, artificial humans from Pugmillion uh, to the present falling in love with statues. And it's by George L. Hersey. And he talks about just that. It's the entire history of the mythology of falling in love with an artificial human. So it's, it's, it talks about homunculus in here. I, I cited some of my information from here too. Oh, wow. Yeah. You have to buy this. It's not. That's dope. Yeah. Essentially that is the history of the alchemical homunculus. Uh, that, that was a crash course in Aristotelian biology the early figures that talked about the the homunculus and there's a bunch of stories and I want to, if I can plug something, I'm going to have something coming up, an upcoming project. My first zine that I have that I'm going to be publishing very soon is going to be on this exact topic, a whole breakdown with pictures, longer quotes, because I condensed some of the quotes because they're very long and source material, bibliography of where I got my information. So the zine is going to be hopefully a, a community project. I would love to, for you to be a part of it. I want to source, uh, you know, different channels to write articles in here. The Occultist Monday, The Hidden World. And this is issue, this is issue number one. It's going to be out on the homunculus. It's going to be 24 pages of just straight homunculus talk and the whole history of it. And yeah, hopefully by the time this episode's out, I'll be done with it. This is a, a, a rough. Yeah, bro. Prototype. I'll order, I'll order a bunch of them and I sell them. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll send you some, bro. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I got, man. And I really like talking about these weird subjects that not a lot of people talk about. You know, a lot of bro, people. Bro, this is the first time I heard about this. I've been very, very interested in learning about this topic. And I'm just so grateful that you laid it out so well i don't think there's anything like this on the internet right now so i'm excited for this to be out there because this information that you brought is just just (laughs) mind-blowing the truth is stranger than fiction so where can everybody find you at the one one podcast on all social media platforms uh, Instagram being my main one. I have a YouTube channel, rockfin.com slash the one-on-one podcast. I do have a Patreon as well, patreon.com slash the one-on-one podcast. And literally anywhere you can find the podcast, one-on-one, one Ayala. And I cover conspiracies. I talk about religion. I do deep dives. I got the Occult Book Club with Paranoid American, uh, where we cover books like this. In detail, we do the dirty work for you. So you don't have to sit and read about dog dicks, right? And dog dick lifesavers, you know what I mean? Like just fighting, magicians fighting with dog dick. Yeah, we do all that for you and we bring, I, re- I did a really deep dive on werewolves, bro. You would think it's like, oh, werewolf, a cryptid? Nah, bro, werewolves go so deep and it's tied into all of this stuff because it's, again, I did a three hour episode on that. Check that out, it's on my channel as well. And yeah, anywhere, one one podcast. If I'm yeah. on there, bro. You got to be, it can't be a werewolf. You got to be a, a wearer. Wolf. <laughs> you got to be aware yeah, of you what's werewolf. going on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I got all the links down below. Uh, much love, bro. Mm-hmm.